hello and welcome to Wild Vittles. I am beyond excited for this podcast because I have the most famous person ever on the Wild Vittles podcast. <laughs> it's Jeff Benda. And and Jeff is, he, he's living my dream as I was explaining to him. He is a professional um, wild game chef and just living that dream out there. He's going to events. He's developing recipes. Um, he's hosting, uh, he's being the chef at events. And so I am, I am so thrilled to have him here today to be able to impart some of his wisdom, uh, to us and talk about his perspective, um, a little bit about his background and how he got started. And, and really, you know, I just see our missions are very aligned in that we're both trying to help people be better wild game cooks. And, and I just cannot thank you enough, Jeff, for, for giving me a, a little piece of your time. No, thanks, Chris. I, you know, you're probably more famous than I am. I don't know about that. I mean, you have a podcast, so, um, <laughs> you, you know, there's dozens and dozens in my, of people that listen to this plus my mom. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I think I once yeah. had a podcast and I think that was about the same for me, but, um, no, I appreciate it. And I've actually been, um, I've been listening, um, uh, to your podcast. I went back and, and I, uh, we're definitely on the same page on a lot of things. So, yeah, my name is Jeff Benda. I uh, born in North Carolina, and um, my dad was in the Air Force and for 30 years. So we actually moved up here to North Dakota when I was seven years old and read The Little House on the Prairie on the way so we would know what life would be like in North Dakota. Um, and being on a military installation, we actually kind of had that vision that everything outside was like that. But uh, I, I grew up just enthralled with the outdoors. Um, I wanted to go fishing. I wanted to go hunting. Uh, I wanted to get lost in the woods. Um, my favorite books were uh, My Side of the Mountain, Sign of the Beaver, um, Island of the Blue Dolphins. Anything where a child was left alone in the woods and had to, and had to make it on their own. Um, this is what I loved. But uh, my dad never took me hunting. And my dad never took me fishing. This was not something that we did in our family. So fast forward, I worked restaurants, pretty much high school, college age, uh, ran away as fast as I could out of North Dakota and worked in Minnesota and Florida. But on my days off, I was always fishing. Um, I was always on the water. And then I ended up coming back to finish up uh, my degree. I came back to North Dakota. And right before I left to go back to Florida permanently, some guys took me duck hunting. And then two weeks later, I went pheasant hunting. And a couple more weeks later, I went deer hunting. And I announced that I was not leaving North Dakota uh, and that I was going to stay. And I, I kind of describe it as... When Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz steps out, everything's in black and white, and then she steps out into Oz and everything's in color. The minute I started hunting, the minute somebody took me hunting, I saw North Dakota in a whole new light, and I absolutely fell in love with it. And so now I, um, really my goal is just to promote North Dakota, promote hunting and fishing in North Dakota, and 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 the wild game recipes that go along with that um so that's kind of how i ended up in the outdoor space that that yeah. is that is a, a really interesting story it's it's um and i can i can completely appreciate that because like you say it's the resources that are around you if you didn't hunt or fish you might view the the whole area and the opportunities around you very very differently uh, yeah, so, I, I didn't even, I hadn't even gone out to the Badlands and explored. Um, I mean, there's just a whole vast array of North Dakota um, that if you're not an outdoorsman or an outdoorsman, I mean, it, it really, you, you can just, you get to explore a lot of new areas, um, yeah. especially if you're a waterfowl hunter, an upland bird hunter and a big game hunter. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of really cool places here. Yeah. You, you picked up on the waterfowl hunting a lot faster than I did. It took me a season of my buddies taking me out and I was like, y'all are crazy because we had to travel quite a ways to the place we we're going to go. Yep. And we'd have to get up like at one o'clock in the morning. morning. And often it was a public land place and we'd have to, you have to be there 
by at least three, if not four o'clock in the morning. And then you might not get a spot as well. And I was just like this, I'm taking a nap, you know, and then going out and going hunting and just like doing without a night's sleep. Was it like that for you? And you still were excited about it? No, uh, we don't have the check-in kind of places okay. here in North Dakota. Yeah. We have public land, um, but then we also have North Dakota is very unique where if the land isn't posted, I've heard this, it's open yeah. to hunting. Yeah. So if there's yeah. not a sign that says do not hunting, or if it's not electronically posted, which you can go on apps like Onyx and check, but if it's not posted, uh, you do not have to ask permission. Now, is it good practice to? Yes. But you will end up in situations where if a field isn't posted and there's 5,000 mallards sitting on it and there's six vehicles scouting it, you better be ready to drive out as soon as those birds leave the field. Because if you wait till two in the morning or three in the morning, there's going to be guys sitting out there sleeping. And they're usually college kids, much younger than, than us older folks who don't want to do that anymore. But no, it, there's plenty of, there is plenty of public land here in North Dakota uh, to hunt, there's tons of opportunity. And do we have a lot of out-of-state hunters? Yes. Do plenty of residents complain about that? Yes. Am I one of those? No. Because guess what? There's another slew or there's another field down the road with plenty right. of birds. So, right. No, yeah. I, that. No, it, I think I feel, you know, if you go across the nation, every, every state has some opportunity to unique to that area. You know, you know what I mean? And some more than others. Right. But, you know, some places it's, you know, maybe they've got black bear. Some places it's waterfowl. Um, I think it's up to all of us to kind of try to figure that out. Sounds like you're really leveraging, you know, your your opportunities you have there in, in North Dakota. But, uh, and I'm, you don't really sound like a North Dakotan. Um, maybe it's your time you sound in Florida. I've got this stereotype in my head, but you may have as well of Texans that we all have a very... Depends on who I'm talking. Role. It depends on when I'm around. When I'm back down right? in the South, I might pick up my yeah. Southern accent again or... If yeah. I'm, if I'm around certain people, then you might hear certain accents, but that's actually not a Fargo thing. If you listen to the movie, if you go to Brainerd, they talk like that. Cause that's actually where it kind of took place most of the movie. So it, yeah, drive a couple hours east here into Minnesota, some small towns and you will definitely, you'll definitely get to see the accents okay. for sure. Okay. Well, you know, I'm really interested at what it sounded like in your kind of background and story. If I talk about just a little bit sure. of your, your chef skills, did, did you train? So I worked at restaurants. School? Yeah, I worked at restaurants. Uh, I was ready to leave for the Culinary Institute of America, the CIA. I was all excited and I was working at a resort on Captiva Island. It's off the coast of Fort Myers. And um, that was a pretty epic situation you're living on the beach uh and working a fine dining restaurant in the evenings and you have all day to fish uh so that was pretty cool but the chefs there I, I was all i was excited to leave and go to school and they said don't the head chef that i worked for he said stay here and work with us and learn because now this is the mid 90s he said you don't want a hundred thousand dollars in debt student loan debt and now this is the mid nineties. And he was talking a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt that scared me to death. So I continued working restaurants, uh, continued to work to work, uh, for chefs. And then when I left, came back here to North Dakota, I kind of got a regular nine to five job, but I always had a catering business on the side. And so I've just, I had that up until, uh, COVID and during COVID I, kind of to transition. Um, I was, you know, I've been married for, uh, almost 14 years to my wife and I was always making wild game into sausage, deer sausage, deer sausage, deer sausage. That every, that's everything was, uh, or wrapped in bacon and my wife, but I, you know, I had these cooking skills and my wife was absolutely sick of deer sausage. And she turned to me one day and said, can you please make this look into this 
right? Can you take some of this venison, duck, pheasant, and make it look like one of these amazing dishes that you do for me on a date night? And she challenged me to do that. And so I did, started taking pictures. Uh, and I think you've mentioned Hank Shaw. And so I actually was posting pictures on Hank Shaw's Facebook page and got discovered. Uh, and somebody wanted to publish one of my recipes and then another one and then another one. And then during COVID, I got on an app. It was Clubhouse. So it wasn't all audio. And there was a bunch of out of work chefs who were doing these Zoom cooking classes. And they said, Jeff, um, so I was kind of talking wild game. And um, I don't know if you know Danielle, the Diva Q. She sells, you might, if you ever, <laughs> she sells Traegers on QVC. She's in the parking lot. Danielle is absolutely phenomenal. She's written multiple cookbooks. She's a great gal. Uh, she's anything, everything Traeger. If anybody wants to know, you can look her up. She's in the parking lot of the Super Bowl cooking with her, with the Traeger for Traeger. Uh, she's great lady but i was on her clubhouse and she we were chatting and she somebody had a question on cooking with wild game on the grill and she said hang on we have a wild game expert here <laughs> and she introduced me and so then it just kind of became this thing on clubhouse and the chef said you know you should start doing a Zoom cooking class because we're making more money than we were as the restaurant doing these Zoom cooking classes. So I did, and that took off. And then uh, long story short, my wife and I were driving back from Bismarck. Our daughter was sleeping in, this was about three hours away. Uh, our, our daughter's sleeping in the back and we had just left Bismarck to go back to Fargo. And my wife said, I think somebody had just, I just sold out on another Zoom class. And she said, I wish there was a way we could figure out for you to do this full time. That'd be pretty cool. And then she fell asleep. And I heard my wife say, you should quit your job and go hunting and fishing all the time. So if there's any ladies listening and you are married, you understand that this is a situation that most men, they, they, may, they may not hear what was actually said. In that situation, it was. So as soon as I got back from to Fargo, I started Ubering 40 hours a week in addition to my, my other job and saved up for six months. And then I quit to start doing what I do now. And it was a really hard first year and then someone asked me to to write a cookbook which had nothing to do with wild game but it, it was a very nice paycheck and then it things just kind of took off and so now i'm able to do it full time and i absolutely love it um i do not get to go hunting and fishing all the time 90 percent of what i do is editing uh, but but it's also a lot of cooking taking photos but it's a lot of editing it's a lot of social media and and stuff on the computer. Every every job has non glamorous right. things, right? But, but I, what we I, see, listen, I, I is, love my job. Yeah. I love what I do. So yeah. that's yeah. very cool. That's very cool. Now that's just that's an epic story, and I appreciate you kind of taking through the the bits and pieces there about you know kind of the incremental and, and some of it you know right being place, at the right, right time right, but absolutely also probably your consistency right. of you know the quality that you're putting forward in the way of your your pictures and your your contributions and you got recognized as that authority right but yeah uh, it was really interesting yeah. if you yeah it's not somebody once told me uh it's not who you know you know you've heard that it's all in who you know it's who knows you and that's really become true for me <laughs> being in the right place at the right time yeah that's that's definitely uh that is very true that is awesome well um just to kind of continue on about about your work, which again, I'm very jealous about your work. <laughs> um, I understand, you know, I, I've, I've, you know, I, I follow your, your Instagram, I've been to your website and I understand that you do, you know, you do, um, you'll, you'll go and cook at events. Sure. Um, you'll, you'll, I, I know you've done butchering, like even almost like a butchering service. I was, I was listening to you on the hunt of and apparently there was a guy that had a couple elk and couldn't find a place to do them. And yeah. Do that. Um, 
and then uh, you know, cook, cook at events. I met you at uh, the BHA Rendezvous about this time last That's year, right. about a year ago this weekend, actually, yeah. is when you were there and you were doing a cooking demonstration. You know, how, how did you, and you kind of talked about this, but how did you kind of branch out into all these activities and how do you keep it all balanced? Because it's, it's, it sounds like a lot. Yeah. Um, I was trying, it's, it's one of those, you, you throw it, everything against the wall, see what sticks. Um, when I quit my job, I promised my wife that I would make as much as I used to and have enough extra to go on her insurance. That way there was no stress. Um, so I was going crazy, trying everything I could to see what worked. And so it, it's kind of a seasonal thing with this, you know, with, with what I, with what I'm doing in the fall, I get hired. People will hire me as their camp cook, their photographer and their butcher. So I'll actually go out with hunters, um, to Montana, Wyoming, Western North Dakota, people will hire me. So I'm not a licensed guide and outfitter. Uh, it's, it's just kind of, I was just able to kind of fall into that there, especially in North Dakota, you can't hunt on public land if you're a licensed guide. Um, it, yeah. So there's all kinds of different rules on that. I didn't want that. I, I love public land and I wanted to be able to be with people on public land because that's some of the most beautiful places here. So I just decided not to go down the, the guide and outfitter route. So I decided to do the, the camp cook photographer and butcher services talk to game and fish, made sure everything, you know, that I was able to do that. So that's a big chunk of my year. Uh, I'm, I'm gone a lot in the fall. Then I also get hired. I'll travel around and do cooking classes, butchering, butchering classes. Um, I've done a pheasant butchering class where I literally showed up with 20, 20 birds and a group of ladies from start to finish were plucking birds and uh, every single part of the bird learning how to cook and do different dishes. Uh, I've gone down to Texas and and done some hunting photography and cooking um, and butchering classes there as well. But I, I just, I, I love the teaching part. That's probably one of my favorite things. But I also, really my dream would be just to, you know, I've got wildgameandfish.com. And if I, honestly, I like the, the teaching part, but because it pays better. But if I could just be home, cook and take photos and make money on that, that was the original dream. Um, you know, I, I would absolutely love it. But I really do like going and sharing it because you can't just do that, right? You you got to get out there and share and share what you know. And and some of the things that I have heard you talk about on your <laughs> the other podcast, I, I'm like, Dude, Chris gets it. We got to hang out because uh, just your perspective on things and meat care and different recipes. I just, I'm absolutely, uh, I just really appreciate what you're doing with that. Oh, yeah. Kind of you. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I think I'm just, you know, like talking into the void, you know, and it's, it's, does anybody care? Does you know, anybody there's know? a guy out in North Dakota who's listening. So <laughs> hopefully after this, I'm going to blast this all over my social media and hopefully we'll get a lot more listeners for you. So that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, you're doing great you know, stuff. I, I know that one of the the things that you're specializing in, and I actually heard, I was listening to one of your other, other uh, where you guessed, you were a guest on another podcast and you were talking about developing recipes and then you were, you know, and, and I, that's a kind of a paid gig, which I didn't realize that was a thing. Yeah. But the whole development of recipe that that seems like black magic to me. It's <laughs> like how do you, how do you start? You know, where, where do you even start on that? Because there are so many recipes out there. So how are you, do you make something unique? Or do you start with the base? What, what's your process? So our our daughter is eight, and I, I don't know if. It, because I know you have kids. So they have this program at the library, local library. It's read a thousand books before kindergarten. So we were just, we, we started going to the library all the time. And I would go and, and sit with our daughter, Lucia, and get some books for her. And then I would go to the cookbook section. Because my wife insisted that I stop buying cookbooks. They're expensive. I mean, you're talking 35, 40, $50, oh, especially some of the... Yeah, no, 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 I got it. Okay, so if everybody sees, since we're on the 
I know for for those of you listening behind me is a huge there's a a whole row of cookbooks from the library. So I read well, those are all from the library. probably for the last all right our daughter's 8. For the last 3 years I have read on average two cookbooks a week. So 100 a year, about 100 cookbooks a year. And that is Amazing. anything and everything I can get my hands on. That's uh, meat care, uh, meat cookbooks, butchering, Indian food, Asian food, African, uh, in anything you can think of, Mexican flavors, um, South American. And what was also a really great gift was when I was driving Uber, I actually still drive a little Uber early in the mornings every once in a while because I meet, there are so many people in Fargo, North Dakota from all over the world, people who have come here to North Dakota because we're, we pay really well. Uh, and so uh, you can make $18 an hour at working at the convenience store in Fargo. Yes. So uh, that's a huge thing. There's people ever from all over the world uh, who are working here, and I get all kinds of great recipe ideas uh, from the people who I drive uh, in Uber. I, I just I like going out there and just meeting people, and and, and I always that's I always my pitch you're in the Uber with your needs recipes. Yeah, every once know, in a while I have it. I always have my business cards, and I'm like, here, email here, me. You know, yeah, email me this recipe that your grandma gave you. Cause they're like, Oh, you got to try this. Um, yeah, Chris, I think, I, I think when it comes to wild game and I've, I've overheard you mention this on your other podcast and, and this is what I'll say. I think everybody overthinks it. It's wild game. If you look on, if you go on the, my website, you will see these are recipes that look like any other recipes that you're going to see on another food blog or in another cookbook that doesn't say wild game on the front. And that is my whole mission is I have a wife and an eight-year-old daughter who I want to enjoy the recipes. I don't want it to be the same thing. And especially if I'm, if I'm putting out a brand new recipe on my website every week, and then I'm selling recipes to different clients for their websites, for magazines, newspapers, I'm doing a lot of different stuff. And I'm, I'm putting myself in that wild game, pheasant in a crock pot, uh, you know, deer sausage, uh, I'm going to run out of recipes pretty quick. And so uh, using more of the animal, that's a huge thing for me, but also just recipe inspiration. I get it from people I meet, every single person, new person that I meet, whether it's in an Uber, I'm in an airport, I'm sitting out next to them on a plane. Um, I sat next to a gal coming back from Texas on a recent trip to Texas when I was down there for teaching a class. She was from Afghanistan. I asked her about food. That that is a great way to connect with somebody. And and she sat and we talked for three hours. I pulled out my notebook, and I would put it away. And she's like, "Wait, I came up. Wait, I got another one. You got to try." And there's another one. I got recipes for goat head that I'm like, "Well, maybe I can try this with a deer someday, I guess." But uh, yeah, there's just all kinds of. If you look around and talk to people, like you, yeah, Chris, I think that was perfect. That it's a universal thing. Everybody, you can connect with everybody on food, and and that's just what I'm able to do. So, really, anybody out there listening, if if you want to know what should I do next, go to the library, pick something. It might be like 30 minute meals, a weekday something, something that's easy, right? It's something that you're paging it through, and it's not like I will never. I don't. I can't find these ingredients in the town that I live in. Find something that you can easily find uh, with ingredients that you can find. Take it home, open it up in front of your family, and let them pick out something that looks good. And then figure out if it's a chicken dish, maybe you can use pheasant or grouse. Um, duck isn't necessarily a good substitute for chicken because you really want to try to treat it with like beef normally. Uh, but, you know, again, but so you can find something that that maybe has a beef or a lamb recipe and use venison, use duck, use goose. It's just going to, it's, it's going to open up your world. Um, and I know uh, I, I've just seen a lot more of that and I'm just really impressed with what 
a lot of other people are doing as well. Well, I'll brag on your site really quick on wildgameandfish.com. You've got a pretty big repertoire of recipes sitting out there. I would say, you know, rivals what Hank has out there, you know, because he's you're kind of going down a similar sure. path in that, you know, you've you've got everything online. And Hank still sells books, which have he cookbooks, which have the same recipes <laughs> that are out there, which I think right. is incredible of like people want that book so bad, even though they could just look it up online, it's more convenient or they, they enjoy the the parts in between, you know, reading. And I wondered, is there a cookbook in your future um, that you might leverage those recipes and kind of pull that together? Yes. <laughs> it's a two year process, but my, um, I'll just put this out there. There is no North Dakota cookbook in existence other than a small town church cookbooks, which there's a ton of great, I, I collect those by the, the way. The, the, some of the best recipes come from yeah. those church cookbooks. German, oh, Russian, Norwegian, um, well. there's all kinds of great influences out there, but yep. um, no, there is no North Dakota cookbook. Now, anybody who's been watching a little bit of the news or maybe you don't, but if you ever come here to, if you've ever been out to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, out to Medora, uh, we're building a, the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. They have a bookstore. Um, at, I've, I've been there at the at Medora, um, but there is nothing. Um, I am currently working on a book where it's a wild game. It's a wild game cookbook. Every, Every species in there, you will be able to find and hunt in North Dakota. That's my dream. And, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be dishes that, um, every single dish in there, it's kind of the same on my website. It is tested and taste it's tasted and tested and approved, uh, by my eight year old daughter and my wife. So we, if I know Chris, you've tried Hank Shaw's recipes. I've tried Hank Shaw's recipes. I love some, I love, you know, a lot of his recipes, but some of them are, you know, super spicy. Uh, but there's also some dishes that I've learned I've gotten from, from people that I've met and I've tried and I, you know, I'm, again, this is recipe development. This isn't just taking somebody else's recipes, um, and putting my name on it, just mixing up, fixing out the protein. When I develop a recipe, I, do I get inspiration from a cookbook or something I might, uh, I might hear about, or somebody gives me yes. But um, there's definitely a different, a slightly different technique. And that's, you know, I always list those things um, on my recipes. But it's also a matter of, there's a lot of things on the internet that, uh, that you'll try. And yeah, not so much. I've, I've experienced it firsthand as yeah. well. I'm like, somebody was just cranking out a recipe. This isn't worth a damn. Yeah, yeah there's so. a, actually a really famous food blogger who has a cookbook i got her cookbook at the library and she said to do her flank steak i hope i pray that it was a misprint and it wasn't her but it said and cook it until an internal temperature reaches 165 degrees anybody who knows cooking steak that's way overdone that's about yeah 30 to 35 degrees too much so yeah. So don't believe everything on the internet unless it's on my website or you're hearing it here on, on Chris's podcast. Right. There you go. Well, you know, something else, and I'm, I'm being self-indulgent. I struggle with food photography. Yeah. I feel like yeah. my pictures don't come out very good. And I look at others like Hank, like yours, and they're beautiful. They, they make me hungry when I look at them, you know? I mean, what, what is, what is something that you could you could guide me to do differently? I know you don't know like how I'm approaching it, but maybe you had a similar experience in as you kind of came up the learning sure. curve uh, with with doing that. Yeah, if you look at some of my earlier photos, especially on 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 Hank's Facebook group page, they're they're not good, um, especially ones that people published. I'm just I'm actually appalled that those actually somebody paid me for those because they were cell phone. Some were cell phone. Others were on the camera that we got when our daughter was born. But I, I traded that in. So right now I shoot. It, it's not 
it's not crazy. Uh, can you do it with your cell phone? Yes. Um, my new, I think I've got a Samsung S23 that I shoot all my video for. Do I use it for photos? No, but I'm just, I like, can you do it? Yes. Are some of the iPhones out there amazing? Absolutely. But I think it's also a matter of after you take the photo, whether it's with a, a DSLR or a cell phone, um, there's editing. I, I think that's just that extra step that nobody, that a lot, too many people don't use but it's super easy. So let's, let's talk through this. So now I've got, you can see behind me, I've got the, I don't have a, um, a mirrorless camera because the minute you jump from, uh, go from the DSLR. So I've got two 7,500s, Nikon 7,500s. It's going to run you about 800, $900. Okay. That's, that's no lens. You don't have a lens yet. Okay. And then you want to, I shoot with a 50 millimeter lens. That is all you need for food photography. Okay. Um, and I, I, I shoot everything. So, and you just need one. And now I have two back here. I have two identical cameras because if I need to swap them, I just swap things out. I just, I don't have to mess with it. Uh, so really, if you, if, if you're going to go the DSLR route, you can get in to it for, maybe with a, a protective case, something like that, $1,100, $1,200. And don't be afraid to buy it used. There's websites out there. Uh, I mean, that's I've done that when I was first starting. Um, feel, free to, feel free to do that. Re, reused, refurbished, they're great. Um, you know, I would maybe get a new lens, but feel free to get a, a used body. And then, and then invest $20 a month. Um, I do Adobe. So Photoshop, it's 20 bucks. And then when you edit a photo in there, then it's saved on the cloud. So now you, especially when I'm doing client work and I'm editing. So I have a copy on the Google drive. I have it on the minute I edit a photo in Adobe, it's saved on their cloud. And then yep. I have another, another copy on my, uh, that's nice. Computer. You have some redundancy, kind of a, a backup in case you have an issue. Yeah, somewhere. and there's all kinds of great things you can do too, uh, you know, on on Photoshop. But but when you pay that twenty dollars a month, then it also yeah. gives you the then you also have access to their video editing software. So and then you can download that on your phone. Uh, just be aware that you need a a lot of memory on a laptop. If you have an old laptop. Uh, that my wife was really excited when I told her we had to buy a new laptop. <laughs> I had to upgrade laptops because Photoshop yeah. does use a lot of space. Yeah, I'm using um, Adobe Premiere Pro yeah. for my editing. Okay. First of all, I felt like I was flying a 747 with all the controls and all that was required. Yeah, learning presets, that, that can be a little yeah. tough. But. but you know, in the first day, I just, I had a headache. I was like, this is killing me, but you know, give me a week or two. And I'm, I'm now I got it down. Yeah. Not that I know everything. I know how to do the things that I do. Sure. And I'm constantly kind of expanding my repertoire as I go forward. Yeah. But, but no, that, thank you for indulging me on that. I think yeah, that may not be of interest to, to everybody listening, you know, but for those of us that but Chris, like it, to post if it's pictures, you or, I mean, if, if you, yeah, if it's you or, or other people out there, if you're, if you're wondering like, Hey, I'm doing food photography and what might, some presets be that I could use, um, shoot me an email, you know, and, and I'd be happy to jump on a zoom call with you or, or, um, just a phone call and, and walk you through it. If, if you have, if you have Photoshop and uh, if anybody out there, I, this is, uh, and you want your photos to look a little bit better, like feel free to do that. I would, I'd love to, t I, I'll take a few minutes and, and walk people through that. That would be great. I really appreciate yeah. that. And I know others will as well. And your email is brilliant um, because it's so easy to remember. It's just Jeff, Jeff in Fargo. Jeff in yeah. Fargo, J-E-F-F-I-N Fargo at gmail.com. That's at a, gmail I scored I that like, one 20 years ago. I, yeah. I was about to say, <laughs> how did that not get taken? But you must've got it at the inception I, of Gmail well, or something. something. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's yeah. That is just too cool. Well, kind of switching gears slightly and you said it already. Um, you're kind of in the education business and I see in your line of work, you're both an advocate and an educator when it comes to wild game cooking. As, as you've done quite a bit of this, what is there a common thread that you see kind of people 
going off the rails or afraid to cross a barrier? Just what's a common issue that you see in people that are trying to to do better at cooking wild game? Um. Well, I I think we have a couple different categories of people. There's the people that listen. I I am not here to persuade someone who loves a pheasant in a in cream of mushroom soup in a, in a crock pot that that's wrong. Go ahead. If you love your venison steak cooked well done, and then eat it with ketchup, go nuts. Right. If as long as you're if you're shooting an animal and bringing it home and eating it. Go crazy. I am not going to tell anybody the way they cook is wrong. If you love it that way, eat it that way. Um, as long as you're eating it, not throwing it away, by all means, go for it. So I am not a food snob when it comes to that. Um, you know, I, I love going to the store and getting a rotisserie chicken when I just don't feel like cooking, you know, it's the same as the, as the next guy. So, um, I, th I think people just tend to overthink. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes is, is everybody tends to overthink it. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we kind of already yeah, covered this, didn't we? So I, I think just, are you looking for mistakes that people are, mistakes. is that what you mean? Well, or? Just, you know, just kind of what people, maybe people ask you questions about, you know, on a consistent basis. I'm just, yeah. Uh, uh, aging is one of the biggest questions that I get. That's one of the biggest, I spend more time at the end of a cooking demo. So I, I travel and do cooking demonstrations and I just, I've already had four this year, um, just this calendar year. And I have another one here coming up next month, but I hang out and, and answer questions afterwards, but, and usually we kind of have a Q and A at the end. Um, dry aging and wet aging is, is, and I, if we start to go down this, you know, down the rabbit hole on this one right now um we'll use up all the time but i think um i really need to write some i i'm working on some blog posts where it actually goes more into depth on that and explaining that because i spend more time working on the importance of aging can you do it without a walk-in cooler yes do i have a walk-in cooler no um that's you know once the mortgage is paid off, my wife knows that's the first thing I would like to do. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that's probably the biggest questions on that um, is aging. But you know, when I age, cause I, I, when I do a cooking demo or I'm, or I explain to people or, I, or I'll show up and people will ask me to bring wild game and I will have, steak that is aged for a couple weeks and then and it might be just dry aging or it might be a mixture of dry aging and wet aging and then i cook it medium rare and then they and then i slice it super thin and it's only seasoned with salt and pepper it's not marinated or anything and it's not even and then they're like this is amazing backstrap i'm like it's bottom round off of a mule deer shot in the badlands of western north dakota and they are just their mind is blown you're lying this is beef it's not like they just they just can't get over it i, I think just the the minute getting that meat cold right away not putting it in your back of your truck and driving around and showing off you know to every bar in, a, in the county that's one thing is is getting that meat cool and then taking the time to age it and then cooking it medium rare. I think that's just, if you're a steak person, what I just, I love steakhouse steaks, but I don't want to pay steakhouse prices. You're literally paying at a really nice steakhouse. You're going to pay $50 for an eight ounce steak. That's a hundred dollars a pound. And you, you know, I can do that at home and with the wild game. And so I, I really think if, if people just do that, I, for my clients get a ton of steak. Oh, and you know, I think you're, are you a fan of the jacquard? I think I, I was going to bring that yeah. up. I, I use a jacquard because of you. That's great. So in, in your demonstration, yep. you were cooking mule deer backstrap, right? And you were showing, demonstrating, you used it then, um, as you were doing the prep and then the cooking and you cooked it just like you described. It was like, 
I think 130, 135 degrees, thinly sliced with, uh, it was pretty fancy because you had some baguettes too. I think you were serving it with. Oh, sure. Yeah. And oh, it was just mouthwatering. Everybody loved yeah. it. Yeah, I think that using a jacquard meat tenderizer, if you go to the website, it's on the homepage. There's a big picture. Okay, like Jeff's yep. favorite kitchen tool or something like that. And, uh, you know, I mentioned. And, and for those who are listening, yeah. I mean, essentially think about like this implement that has like, I don't know, there's probably 30 small knife blades. Yeah, on, there's, you I know, think then, some come with 48, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was guessing. Yep. It, but essentially you're you're penetrating that steak with these, these small blades, you know, to kind of tenderize right. it. If you have marinade, I think it would help with some of the absorption. It does. As yes. well. So it, I think it, I think it does really good. You know, I, like I said, I ha I bought one right after uh, I got back from the rendezvous when you did the cooking demonstration. Sure. So yeah. 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 Everybody asked me, I travel around and do, they're like, you should start traveling with these and selling them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least hand out a link, you know, or a scan card. So they buy it. Yeah. Amazon something like, like that. Yeah. Like that. Um, yeah. Feel free. If anybody's listening and you want to buy one, go to wildgameandfish.com and click on it. Cause I think I get 3% with every purchase. <laughs> a little, every little bit helps. My wife would appreciate it. Um, no, I think if you're going to get a tool, anything for the kitchen and you're going to be processing uh, any kind of steak, but you know, that, that's whether it would beef, uh, lamb, chicken, we'll, you know, we'll use it. Oh, it's amazing. Especially with goose breast, Canada goose breast. We, our season is long here. I mean, we start August 15th. Um, and we can shoot a lot of geese. So, um, especially by the way, if anybody is listening and I listened to the podcast with you and your buddies, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. If you guys oh, want to come you. up to North Dakota and go waterfowl hunting, we would love I that. will take you. Um, yeah, I will absolutely Very take careful. you. We'll take you up on no, that. I will we'll take you. This is not door. a, this is not a, a finance situation. I would just, I would love to take you guys and you, um, have you guys come up because we have a ton of birds, uh, and yeah, we can start goose hunting August 15th and then non-residents have to wait till October to, for the rest of duck. Yeah. So we have six weeks of goose hunting, Canada goose hunting before ducks even start. So yeah. Um, so we do a lot of geese. So, but again, that's your card. It works great for those, for the, it might be that tougher, you know, like an old Canada goose that's, 15 years old um you know or uh a bighorn sheep or you know a, like an old deer anything like that but that jacquard meat tenderizer is just amazing and you know I, I was i was listening to another podcast that you were a guest on and you mentioned that you were utilizing the jacquard when you were processing yes and i think that was aimed towards like your your gifting a little bit of venison diplomacy some some meat to some folks and you want it to be perfect when they take it out of the package i had until i heard that i had always thought oh it's for when i defrost and about to prepare it, do you how do you handle it do you just do you do both or does it depend upon the situation so generally i'll when i get an animal i'm leaving it in the in the big cuts, like, so like a hind quarter, like a whole hind quarter or a front shoulder. And I'm just, I'm wrapping it up and freezing it. Cause I, when it's season, it's season. Now it's also, not a lot of people know. I also, I, I farm soybeans and corn with my father-in-law and my brother-in-law. Yeah. Um, and my brother-in-law and I are actually taking over next year. So it, is it a huge operation? No, but, um, it is a lot of work, but I also have to be between that and clients. Um, when I go hunting, it's, am I applying for a buck in North Dakota? Yes. Okay. Cause it's 30 bucks, but do I get one every year? Absolutely not. But so I shoot a lot of does. Generally we shoot about, we need about six deer antelope every year for for my wife and I and, and our daughter to that is an amazing amount of game. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, that, between that's cooking, to, you're using it. Yeah, all. so I mean, I'm doing recipes and I'm I'm you know, I'll gift some or you know we'll have people over and things like that. So yeah, we need about six deer a year, or six antelope deer. You know, not, not all of them are big, so some of those are Texas deer, right? I need to shoot nine of those to equal one mule deer. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> North Dakota. No, they're, they're, they're like not antelope. Yeah. yeah. But the, yeah, they're, they're a little yeah. small. Yeah. But, um, so I, I'm leaving them in the, in the hole. Okay. So when I, when I cut that up, uh, it's still a little frozen. So when I'm, when I'm cutting it and packaging it up, I'm, but yes, I think Chris, you, you heard me say this on another podcast. Every time I package it, I don't know if I'm going to be cooking it, if I'm going to be out of town and my wife's going to cook it, or if I'm gifting it to somebody who knows nothing. This is their first experience with wild game. So I always make sure I remove the silver skin, um, that it's aged, that I remove all the silver skin, that I have gone over it with the jacquard meat tenderizer, and then it's wrapped up and ready to go. Um, I just, it, it needs to be ready as soon as it gets out. So I'm not, I'm not brining it. I'm not, you know, seasoning it, anything like that. When it comes to um, ground beef or ground venison, which I, I really appreciate it. Was on, it was on one of the podcasts. It was, it was your podcast that I was listening to. And I appreciated you were talking about not adding fat automatically. So when we started doing, when I started processing my own and I followed the rule, right? Pork fat, go and grind it up with pork fat. And my, the minute my wife saw that big chunk of white fat in there and I, it wasn't a lot, right? She was, she was like, I, I don't want this. No, I, I don't want pork fat in my burger. Just give me the burger. I want the lean burger. So we do that. Now, so literally all of the ground beef or sorry, all of the ground venison, whether it's elk, deer, mule deer, whitetail, doesn't matter. I will, I grind it up and I do not add fat. At that point, I do not add fat. So, and I don't season it. It's not taco meat. It's not uh, anything like that. That way when my, my wife can just go in at nine, do I do 99% of the cooking? Yes. But that way, when I pull it out, it it's ready. It it, it's it can ready. go into every so many different directions. Yeah, it's a blank canvas. Yes, at that point. especially you when you're yeah it. when you're coming up with yeah. recipes, especially like I do for a living, and I'm and I go in the freezer and I've got all it's it get to the end and I'm like, why do I have ten pounds of taco meat? Like, what was I thinking? Right? I have no plain venison. I just I want my daughter wants a a tater tot hot dish. Um, you know or uh, something like that and something really simple just with burger and I can't do it because I've already I've I've done that. So yeah, we don't add meat or we don't add fat. Will I do it? I when I pull it out, will I maybe add some bacon? Yes. Or butter. Uh just some olive oil and just mix it in there just to add that fat. Yes, do you need some? Yes, but but I really appreciated listening to you talk about that in an earlier one of your podcasts. So if you missed that podcast where Chris was discussing that, go back to the beginning, everybody. Listen to them and like them because he has a lot of great stuff on his on on the earlier ones. Yeah, you're, you're very kind. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, and I'm, I'm mindful of time, so I'm I'm jumping actually down to some lower questions here because sure. we're. I'm really enjoying the conversation. A lot of it was self-indulgent because I want to make sure I, I got some of these, these, cause you, like I said, you live my dream here. Um, but so let me get into the cooking a little yes. bit. What, what, is, what is your favorite recipe, you know, and it, I know I'm kind of asking you to pick a fa favorite child almost, you know, and, and so, but if you were like, you can only have, you know, cook one recipe right now, what would it be? From a protein stamp, uh, antelope, I have not in my freezer. It's my wife's favorite. I, love it as well. antelope. I think it's fantastic meat. I have come home with anything and everything, including elk. My wife will always, and I will always tell you. The antelope that we've it's had. so tender. Yes. Um, got it on ice right away. Aged it for, I think it was a little over two weeks. Um, just treated it right. And we literally were cutting that back strap with a fork it was unbelievable and again salt and pepper it was just I, I think i did it on the cast iron 
seared it, finished it off in the oven until it was like perfect. Hundred and uh, I'll do a one twenty five, but she needs one thirty. Take it off, let it rest, and then it's going to go up a couple more degrees. It was just absolutely phenomenal. And watching my wife just devour that thing um, and us being able to enjoy it. It reminds me of our earlier date, you know, our, our first dates. And I, I just, I just have fond memories of that and just being able to, um, to sit down and still enjoy a really good steak with her and, and my daughter too. My daughter is like enthralled with, uh, and it has to be sprinkled with truffle salt. For for Lucia, that I've talked to, yeah, Lu- said that is yeah the ingredient. Yeah, yeah. my eight year old is enthralled with it, and I have to keep two containers in our house, one for when I have events, and the other one for her. I will catch her in the cupboard, sticking her finger in her mouth to wet it, and then sticking it in the salt. <laughs> so we have one labeled Lucia's truffle salt, and I will catch her doing that. Uh, yeah. So I, I think just a simple steak. You know, there's all kinds of great recipes. I, I My wife loves Indian food. So when I can transform wild game into Indian food, uh, there's a couple recipes on the website and, and lots more to come. Um, that's phenomenal. Because takeout is expensive. But but yeah, I just I just love a simple steak. You, you hit on Indian food. I was curious if you had a favorite cuisine i tend to kind of err on the side of like tex-mex mexican spanish influences but where i live i have easy access to latin markets do you have something that you like in particular uh yeah i'd probably say my personal preference would be would be mexican tex-mex i worked at a lot of those a lot of those restaurants um when i wasn't doing fine dining i was i was in those kinds of restaurants in three different states, but that's so why I ate a lot. I mean, I ate Mexican food every day, right? And I was a trainer, and so I mean, I was just like I was constantly because of the the turnover in the restaurant. Um, I was constantly eating Mexican food, and I absolutely love it. Uh, don't get to enjoy a lot of it, so that probably is one of my favorites because my wife just, you know, my daughter and I we could eat tacos every day, right? Um, but, but with Melissa. Um, it's kind of one of my treats, um, but a, you know, a good thing of enchiladas or, um, I have a newer, a newer sister-in-law who is from Ensenada, Mexico. And so it is getting real tortillas. It's just, uh, yeah, there's a lot more Mexican dishes coming with, when it comes to wild game. Cause she, yeah, she's just, she's absolutely phenomenal. And she's a great teacher as well. Very patient with me. Yeah. I, I can tell you appreciate, you know, kind of all the, the you know, the Mexican Spanish cuisine. Um, just a quick tip. If you haven't seen it on Netflix, there is a, a series called the Taco Chronicles. And they go through and talk about each of the different kinds of tacos. Because, okay. you know, I just think of an American taco, yeah. like, you know, the ground beef. But no, no, no. There's Taco Pastor, the governor. There's the, you know, carne asada, the guisada. You know, it's like, oh, you, I would highly recommend it. You know, if you if you're interested at is all and tacos then, dorado thing i think about what's that is it tacos dorado i just saw my sister-in-law last weekend this last weekend and she was talking i wrote it down but she showed me a picture and she's like you should try this these and it looked really good but now i i'm trying to remember which one it was but yeah there's yeah. just so many different kinds of tacos yeah. so i'm i'm enthralled with with tacos as a general category there's so much to so much to dive in there yeah what about what about prep method you know like for, I had a phase while I, everything had to be on the grill, you know, and, and, and now I'm, maybe it was cause it's so damn hot last summer. I'm doing everything <laughs> inside on the cast iron. Do you have a, a preference? Of, no, of I really don't. Prep method. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know? it has been crazy unseasonably warm here in North Dakota. We have no snow. Now there's another snowstorm coming this weekend for the St. Patrick's Day parade. Everyone's really excited. The, the one time, right. It's been in the sixties. There's no snow on the ground. It's been in the 60s, and this has just been crazy. And it's been like that for, for like a month. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we were, we've been grilling because of it. I think. Yeah. The I last mean, three had... days, I've been grilling. But I just I I swore off the use of the Instapot. Everybody was jumping on the Instapot, 
Everybody had Instapot recipes. I was like, I, I have refused yeah, um, uh, to do it as well. I did too. And then Christmas, I used my sister-in-law's for a roast, a venison roast. And it was like the amount of time it took to get that perfect and just shred apart. I'm like, what's happening here? And somebody uh, actually sent me one, uh, a pressure cooker to try out and do some recipes. So I pulled it out of the box and uh, goose legs, pheasant legs, a nine-year-old bighorn sheep roast. Um, holy buckets. It was just like... <laughs> I know, I'm used to, you know, like I'm a Dutch oven, like sit, you know, Dutch oven and the just pull having it in the oven for hours and hours and hours and letting the aromas fill the whole house. This is an all day affair. But man, when that thing comes together in an hour, um, I'm also a, a realist. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a dad with a, a wife and a daughter and, you know, we need weekday meals. So, um. I will use any tools available to me. So I really, no, I really don't have a favorite because I keep getting new favorites. I, I but I haven't done the sous vide yet, which I think is absolutely bizarre that I haven't after all these years. Yeah, yeah, catering. Really well, we did catering. It. Have I ever done it yeah. with wild game? No, which I, it, hmm. it, it's just weird. We did, yeah. we use it for I, catering. Yeah, but I've just, I've only recently started using it and it really is fantastic. Yeah. But um, a, an Instagram friend of mine, um, I, I asked him about it cause he had tried it before I tried it and he said, it, it, you get a great result, but he goes, but it's not fun. I'm like, what do you mean? And, and he said, and I agree with him after doing it. He goes, there's no smoke, yeah. there's no sizzle. It's, it's just, you know, yeah. now yeah. you get a little bit of that when you do the sear, right? But there's, there is an allure there for me, especially if you're hosting and you need to get like a lot of steaks done at once. I could see a real value. Yeah. We that, used to use but, it for chicken breast quite a bit. Um, yeah, for events, that's, but um, yeah. So yes, no, I absolutely I, see the I, utility of it. Um, yep. I came across one. I think it was my parents' house. Um, they like to click on things and purchase a lot of things on the internet. I don't know if anybody has parents like this. Um, yeah, but I usually yeah Christmas time and I something on my wish list. I usually end up with two or three of them. Come ship. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, but I saw a brand new sous vide in a box. Um, we were just up there helping my parents and do a little cleaning. And I was like, Hey, do you, did you guys know you have this? So my mom's like, Oh yeah, just take it. Go ahead and try it out. I was like, okay, great. So still haven't done it. Still have not done this Chris, but um, it's on my list. So I'll have to call yeah. you for advice on that. Cause I, uh, <laughs> yeah, Bill, I'm, 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 I'm very, thin sliver of experience yeah. but i, was I mean i, I haven't really impressed years. i mean well yeah. probably yeah 15 years i bet you um yeah it's, it's been quite a while yeah i'll have to give the instapot a try i've just been a holdout you know it's like I, i'm kind of anti-technology i want to keep things simple right. but it is a pressure cooker is all of it, it is. right and it's yeah. just got a new name you haven't tried the air fryer though have you that's uh yes have you really and I followed a recipe and I was all excited about it mm -hmm. and I never went back yeah. and now people are like, they rave about it. I, I had a bad experience with some shrimp. Um, and I just, yeah, I just, it, it, it went away. It went in, it came in the house as like a, Hey, you should try this. And it went right back out. And I have not, I have a ton of people come up to me and they're like, at cooking demos they're like you've got to try an air fryer it's amazing it was just like this last one a month ago i was here in fargo doing one and she was like no you got to try it it's i'll send you a recipe i'm like there's plenty of people with air fryers if you send me a recipe i will try it again i will um but yeah i don't know i have you you have had luck or you said you have not had i well i haven't i have refused to try it on principle okay. because yeah. i mean so you're like you and okay. me on the pressure cooker for years. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I'm just, I'm not, it's funny because in my professional life, I do a lot of things with technology, but in my hunting and fishing, I like things simple. So yes. for instance, when I fish, I fish in a kayak that's powered by pedals. 
there is no electronic devices on it. There's no fish finder. There's no nothing. The, the most fancy electronic device I have on there is I'm required if I'm out before sunrise or after sunset, that I have a 360 degree light that's run by like three AA batteries. That is it. So I'm kind of an anti-technology when it comes to some of my, my things like in my smoker. You know, I know guys have triggers, God bless them. They can start them remotely from work and you can sit there and just like hold the temperature perfect and all that. And it's a great product. I have a, I have an offset stick burner, you know, that I have to feed oh, wow. the, you know, the logs yeah. into and I have to sit there and adjust everything to keep, you know, the temperature right. I have this propensity to do things the hard way, you know, so. I when it comes to smoker, you, well, I'm not, I'm not at that. <clears throat> I did buy a $250 smoker. I did not go trigger. A lot of my friends who, you know, like Danielle, she'd be really mad at me. She'd try to talk me into it. But I, I, my old master built that I bought the month before my wife and I got married. So I wouldn't have to ask permission to do it. Um, I bought a lot of decoys too. A lot of duck decoys right before the wedding. Yep. But anyway, yep. um, a wise man. Yes. Um, but that master built smoker, just an electric smoker lasted me. 15 years no i no i'd be 14 years and um i just bought i just replaced it i just bought a new one um you know i, I just yeah they have the apps and all my friends are like well no man you don't even have to test it you can go, you can adjust the temperature and everything like that i'm like you know if i'm going to be used the smoker i want to be home smelling it enjoying it um yeah that's right. Oh, by the way, when it does come to being jealous, I saw your post with you in the kayak. Was that just last week? You do. I was jealous of you. You talk about like, oh, I'm so jealous, Jeff, of the way your life. You're listen, man. You're out fishing, okay? Our ice fishing. I didn't get to go out once because of our warm weather. It, this fishing has turned into a disaster here. But when I saw you in the kayak, um, God, I wanted to be there. It just looks phenomenal. And, yeah. It is phenomenal. The weather. That's another is thing perfect. on my wish list is to get that paddle. Yeah. yeah, we have a canoe, and we're right on the river here. But um, it's a river, and the levels are just—you never know if it's. You know, one day it's flooding, and it just—it just was kind of a crazy condition. So, it's not really a good river for for regular conditions. But yeah, I absolutely. Um, that kayak fishing, man, that looks phenomenal. It is fantastic. Now that is a small sliver of my overall kayak fishing because that's, um, white bass. It's the spring spawn. Yeah. And so I'm in creeks on that. The majority of my time will be actually out on the coast. And so you don't have land nearby, but it's equivalent, although it's a lot windier equivalent experience of just out with nature and the birds yeah. and then hopefully the fish are biting. Yeah. I'd like but, to try it. Uh, my mom grew up in Tampa Bay. And so we go down there. I have been down there quite a bit. I haven't been down there in, in almost a year now, but you know, I see, I see guys and gals out there in the kayaks and just, yeah, God, just, yeah, I love it. Yeah. I would really like to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have me blushing here that you're actually looking, you're listening to my podcast, looked at my Instagram, man, it's just check, check. You know, I can, I can, I can uh, go to bed smiling tonight. So I appreciate your support. Yeah. I know I was, um, we were grilling out today. Some, um, and I was buttering the buns and I told my wife, I was like, Hey, you know, how you, she's like, make sure you toast the buns. I said, you know, who else has to have their buns toasted is Chris's wife. I heard that on one of the very first podcasts. I was like, you two would get along. Great. <laughs> Chris's wife and you both need their have to have toasted buns. <laughs> so Chris, I am listening, buddy. I am paying attention to your, um, that information that you're putting out there. That's, that's a very important step, by the way, everybody, if you're not toasting your buns, put some butter on there and do that. It's a, it's a very important step. It'll highly, um, increase the enjoyability of every burger. So I, I would agree. Yes. I would agree. This is coming from a guy who got to start in a burger joint. So, yeah. Very impressive. Well, Jeff, you know, we're, we're, we're nearing about an hour and I want to, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, just a couple of kind of round out questions sure. is, you know, our, our listeners, hopefully are people that are trying to improve their game around wild, you know, game, fish, deer, any, any kind of like bits of wisdom you like to impart, you know, as, as we're, we're getting ready to wrap up, you know, what is it like in your classes or when you're 
cooking for somebody that you, you generally share with people? Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to try new things for sure. And I know that can get very scary, especially when now I talk about, yeah, I'm trying all these different things because, well, cause I shot six deer, right. And I have a lot of protein to, uh, to experiment with. And I know not everybody is blessed with that. So if you've only got two goose breasts in your freezer, if you've only got two pheasant breasts in your freezer, you know, you might be scared to try something different. I like it this way. And so, you know, I get that. But if you do have kind of that opportunity, A, I would say if you really do want to get into more of wild game cooking and you and like you really want to start using more of it and you have that opportunity to not be so picky on a buck tag or a bull tag. Gosh, you guys, there's, I mean, I don't want to start naming states because then the, the, the possibilities of, of me getting a tag um, are going to go down. But, um, and I know they just made some changes in Montana that are, I was just, I was just ready to throw up because I got the email. Um, that used to be my big meat hunt. Um, but in the units where I hunt now, you can't hunt on public land for does, mule deer does. You can, um, and in those units, a non-resident can only get one tag. Um, that's pretty disappointing. But there are so many opportunities. There are so many states, people that I talk to that you, if you want to go out and just get out there and go hunting and experience that, there are people that I run into and they're like, oh, my freezer, I haven't had venison in the freezer, deer in the freezer for four years. I'm like, really? They're like, no, because they want to hunt on that farm that they grew up farm hunting on. They absolutely love hunting. They are like obsessed with it. They watch, they, they listen to, you know, podcasts like this all year. They watch it on, they watch it on TV. Um, but then they just are stuck in that. I am only going to hunt deer on this one piece of property this one week. And I'm telling you, um, I hunt from August. Um, I can hunt August through April you know, between hunting, this isn't fishing and outdoors, um, or even into May, actually, because I mean, really, you could do that. Because so August with with early goose here, all the way into spring bear, if you wanted to, um, just if you love the outdoors, I would just really highly encourage everybody to, to maybe think outside the box and get a cow elk tag. Or a doe apply for a doe tag. Um, and, and just, just be able to go out there and experience it. So, and feel, you know, keep applying for that buck tag or that bull tag. But if it's going to be six years or five years and you are obsessed with hunting in the outdoors, like Chris and I are, get out there and get a doe tag, you know, and it's, they're cheap. They are not, it is not expensive at all. Um, there, there's a lot of great opportunities for that. Um, and I think just, like I said, you know, cooking steaks, medium rare, if you haven't done it, try it. Um, really just, uh, meat care is a huge thing. I don't think we got to, um, you know, the guys who put meat in a cooler with ice water for, oh man. I, I know we don't have time to get into that, but I just, I just really... Yeah, I had a lady, I was giving a cooking demonstration, and she was on the phone with her son. Who and he's like, well, I change out the ice every two days. Like they leave it in there for a week. They're whole deer. And I'm like, oh dear heavens. You know, so um, I'm just gonna say this on that. I, I gotta address this, Chris. Okay. If you went to a steakhouse, you're gonna pay a hundred dollars a pound for a steak or whatever. You can go to what just any restaurant. I don't care what it is. You can go to Applebee's. They're like, hey, we're you're gonna have the you order the steak at Applebee's. And they're like, well, come pick out your steak. It's like picking out your lobster. And they bring you to the back of the kitchen and they open up the cooler and it's all a bunch of gray meat because it's been sitting there for a week. And they're like, all right, pick out your steak. You would be mortified. This is not, this is not good food safety at a restaurant. We expect more out of a restaurant and we should expect more out of ourselves and um, how we treat meat. And so, yeah. 
Um, yeah. I'm just going to leave it at that, Chris. And if anybody wants to discuss it more, yes. feel free to shoot me an email. You've given it out. They yeah. can go back and or go to the website and, and you can reach me then. But um, yeah. Yeah. There are some firm believers in that method, but I'm with you of, of you know, and, and just to kind of expand on that so the listeners understand yeah. that there, there are some folks that like to put a deer in a cooler and then put, put it on ice, let that ice kind of drip off and melt and they'll have the spout open and they'll leave it in there a week two weeks yeah. and they'll change out the ice. What they're essentially doing is leaching out all of the flavor. Out yeah. Of Cause they meat. don't want the gamey Plus, taste. Right. That the, that, you know, and I'm right. using air quotes for those who can't see me, the gamey uh, taste in there. I'm like, well, no, it's just because it doesn't taste like chicken or beef. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It tastes like deer and under the right circumstances, like you described and you're cooking it to the right temperature, just a little salt and pepper. It's one of the best damn things you'll ever put right. in your mouth. I but think. putting so, it in water for a week, and just setting it in there in, in that cold water. We're talking food yeah. safety issues abound, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You really yeah. want to keep no, you dry. And I a thousand um, percent aligned. Yeah. On that. So yeah. anyway, well, Jeff, I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this and the time flew by and I don't want to cut it off, but I also don't want nope, to make that's this. All right. I mean, if, if I were, if I were Steve Ranella, I could make it or Joe Rogan, <laughs> I could make a three hour podcast. I can't listen to Joe Rogan yeah. because they're so long. That's I got to cut and, them off. Yeah, and then people yeah. would listen to. No, them, I right? like. I like. So I want to make sure yeah. people know where to find you. So wildgameandfish dot com is your website. Uh, your Instagram is under the similar name where they can put in Jeff Benda, correct? Uh, and, yeah, and it's where... wild game. So yeah, the website is wildgameandfish dot com. The Instagram is wildgameandfish. Um, so you get so everybody can find me there. Um, if you want to, when you're on the website. Um, I would love it if everybody subscribed. There's a there's a there's a spot on there. Subscribe to the weekly newsletter. That's all you're gonna do is uh, you're gonna get a new recipe every single week. So that's gonna end up in it's your like inbox a gift. every week. You get yep. every single idea. Re week. You get a brand new recipe. Yep. And so, yeah. And those again, they're family friendly recipes that everybody can use. And so that's what I'm gonna. Uh, that's what I'm gonna send you, and then, uh, you know. When the cookbook is done, you'll be the first. You guys will be the I'll first be to know. But to um, we're a little ways and, off. And if people are like Jeff, the website just isn't enough. I need to come shake your hand. Where can they find you? I, I know you're going to be yeah, come to the, the BHA rendezvous. rendezvous. Right? I'm gonna. I'm actually going to have a booth this year. So the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous uh, is going to be in Minneapolis this year. Um, so if you want to come and stop by the booth and say hi, uh, and we're going to have. Especially if you want to win a hundred dollar Shields gift card, I'm going to have a couple of those. Um, so feel free to stop by the booth and uh, put your name in the in the hat for for one of those. But um, you know, or you can just reach out. There's a um, there's a page on the website uh, where you can see any events, speaking engagements that I'll be at coming up. They'll, and I I'll keep that updated. And so if anybody wants to to do that, or really anybody listening here and and you're on the podcast and you want to come and go hunting or fishing in North Dakota, um, paddlefish snagging, the big giant fish, phenomenal, crazy experience. May 1st, Williston, North Dakota. If anybody wants to come out, it is a phenomenal experience. It's crazy. If anybody wants a road trip up here, um, you know, we're, we're camping out there. There's a free campsite. Uh, if anybody wants to make that trek May 1st, um, come on out and join us down on the river. Um, but just any, if anybody wants to come out and come bird hunting or, and really experience that, just f feel free to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to, uh, to kind of guide you in the right direction, what you need to do. And, and also some places of where you want to try out. Well, you know, clearly, you know, you're, you're a genuine and, 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 uh, just you know, authentic person. I really appreciate you, Jeff. And just, you know, to, to let people know Jeff really means this. I mean, like, I had met Jeff just a year ago and we had kind of hooked up on Instagram. Um, and you saw that I had this, uh, this podcast and before I could even, I was going to reach out to you. You reached out to me before I could and said, and you volunteered. You said, Hey, I'd love to come on. And I just deeply, deeply appreciate that. And like I said, you are the most famous person I've had on this <laughs> podcast. And I, I mean, this is like having, I, you know, I need to I, connect you with some people, Chris, so we can get you uh, some more names on here. Well, it's, it's you know, <laughs> I, I, I tend to make analogies of, of how, you know, celebrities. And so at that, you know, it was the, the rendezvous, the BHA rendezvous in Boise. 
and I got to eat breakfast with Randy Newberg. And I, because we were just you, I am so both, jealous. Yes, my daughter. We both were standing. My there. My daughter was devastated when I told her again because I found out um, I'm doing the big field to table dinner, kind of on the eve, the first night of the BHA rendezvous. If anybody wants to go, it's only six hundred dollars a plate. You heard that six hundred dollars a plate, but it's only a thousand dollars for a couple. So bring a friend and save some dough. Um, but every year I do this and I've been helping and Randy is never there. And my daughter is, my daughter is enthralled with Randy Newberg. So last year I did get to meet him and he signed a book with his good arm. Cause he had a, his broken arm in a sling. Yeah. So I did get a couple minutes with him. Um, if anybody just uh, Randy Newberg is nicer in person than he is. Um, Ryan Callahan. If anybody meets, go to the BHA Rendezvous. You're for sure going to see Ryan Callahan because he's always there. Randy will make an appearance. Um, he's not going to be there at the dinner, so I won't get to cook for him. But Randy will be there uh, in Minneapolis, um, which is perfect because he's from Minnesota. But, um, but yeah, Ryan Callahan and Randy Newberg, these are people that I met, and they truly are nicer in person than on TV, which I they're, love they're to see. They're fantastic people. Yeah, I, agree. I absolutely love I to agree. see. I agree, but... I was going to say when I had when I had breakfast with Randy, I told him I said I was like I I'm I've never had breakfast with a famous person. This is better than than sitting down with Tom Cruise. And he was like, "Oh, I'm gonna have to tell Kim that." This is his wife, you know. So I will give the same analogy as you know. I feel like this is better than having you know George Clooney on my on my podcast. So well, I, my my wife I really might appreciate choose Jeff. George Clooney over me. I'm not sure how. Well, now she's probably somebody younger. George Clooney is maybe a little bit older for her. But um, no, not, I appreciate not older, it, Chris. Just better. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, again, Chris is doing. Anybody who is maybe this is the first podcast that you're listening to, go back. Definitely subscribe to this podcast um, and go Thank back you. and listen to some of the earlier ones. Especially, I think it's just a fun conversation. Um, you sitting around with your with your buddies from the BHA um, Texas Board. Um, that's a great podcast. I just absolutely love listening to that. Oh, you guys are hilarious. It just, it just, it just brought me back to sitting around with my hunting buddies, um, yep. and having those fun conversations. But again, um, you're doing great work. Um, I really appreciate it. I think you're doing, this is a great podcast. You got a great, um, a great angle with it. Um, I really appreciate what you're doing and, and I really encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. You're making my head swell, man. I'm not going to be able to get my head swell. No, and I think, but, but you know, I think you need to expand on those waterfall recipes. So definitely grab those Texas BHA guys and come up here and our, the North Dakota. I'm on the North Dakota BH, BHA board. Um, and cool. so we would love to uh, to have you guys come up here and, we, and I, hang I out. I guarantee when they hear this, us. they're going to be like pinging me immediately going, where, when? Yeah. And so. have them all listen, and that way you'll have you'll double your um you'll double your listeners. It'll it'll be all those <laughs> all those guys plus my mom. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. Well, Jeff, thank thank you very much. I'll we'll sign off with that. I just you know encourage everybody, uh, you know, really strive to be a better wild, wild game cook. Go look at Jeff's website, um, his Instagram, and try new things. So, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you listening. And until next time, good night and good luck. Thank you.